So the percentage of uh, cats with diabetes that actually have underlying acromegaly was unraveled in a, a huge study we did over more than a decade where we screened diabetic cats across the UK for underlying acromegaly by measuring insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1, which is a test that can be run on a serum sample and uh, our lab as well as other labs uh, can run that for you. Um, and in that study we found that amongst the 1200 diabetic cats in the UK presented to first opinion practice one in four in fact suffers from acromegaly so that's a huge number and when I went to vet school people said didn't really spend time on explaining to me what is acromegaly because it was perceived to be a disease that we shouldn't uh, spend time on there were more important things to talk about now this study really has put that into a different uh, light um, acromegaly is a big disease now amongst cats especially diabetic cats probably also in non-diabetic cats but for any diabetic cat i would now say talk to the owner at time of diagnosis and tell them that there are reasons why cats become diabetic one of those reasons is acromegaly in fact one in four of cats suffer from acromegaly induced diabetes and we could screen for that disease for you by simply running a serum IGF-1 uh, by sending off that sample uh, and that's not amazingly expensive either and I would discuss this with the client because the worst that could happen is that you don't mention it the diabetes turns out to be quite difficult to control or it takes years for it to develop into a difficult diabetic and then the owner does a google and finds out one in four in fact have acromegaly um, and come back to you and say why didn't you mention that to me um, so i think as a modern clinician up-to-date clinician we should now proactively mention the possibility of screening to clients whose cat has been diagnosed with diabetes um, and then many will go for that test because to tell an owner uh, your cat has got diabetes is very different from telling an owner you've got got uh, you, your cat has got diabetes because of a brain tumor um, and nowadays we can actually cure this disease as well for those owners that want to go down that route so that's another reason why you want to be screening for it Um, in my practice, yes, I would recommend screening and I have my clients actively um, not go for it, uh, but I actively ask the question or recommend it um, so that later on, you know, if we still want to screen for it later on because things are not going well, they know that I've spoken to them about it and they know I was keen on screening for it because one in four is a lot. And uh, it means that also we've got a type of diabetes that potentially we could cure in 85% of the cases. So, so for me, even if they don't go for treatment, to know that there is a brain tumor causing the diabetes puts everything in such a different uh, light and, and therefore makes the journey that we are about to embark upon much clearer with the diabetic pet owner. So, so I, would, I would recommend it, yes. Yeah, so if we find ourselves in a situation where we are increasing the insulin dose and nothing really is improving, then we first need to think about uh, what is not improving. Is it uh, the glucose values that, is, that are not improving whilst the clinical signs are actually controlled? Then I would start to doubt the glucose values, which is perfectly possible because any glycemic parameter in a diabetic cat can lie to you. And therefore we should always rely on the clinical signs above and beyond anything else and then use the glycemic parameters as a tool to interpret the clinical signs. And this is why we've developed a diabetic clinical score. We'll try to uh, put this scoring system in the video as well, um, which actually focuses on quantifying the clinical signs because the clinical signs don't lie unless the, the client is lying to us, but on average, they don't lie as much as the glucose values, um, including fructose means. So sometimes, therefore, a difficult diabetic is not difficult, but the tools that we are using are lying to us. 
in which case we need to ignore those tools and we need to focus on the clinical signs. Now sometimes the clinical signs are also out of control and the tools, the glycemic parameters, the glucose curves, the fructosamines, they back that up. And in that case, if we are finding ourselves in a situation where we give more than one and a half units per kilo per injection on a BID protocol, we should be looking for reasons why that is happening. And in the first instance, I would check out with the owner whether or not there are management issues that are wrong. So are they injecting the insulin into the carpet instead of into the pet? Yeah, well, that would be an obvious reason. So I get them into my consult room, show and let them show me how they are injecting their pet. Uh, go over how they store their insulin and make sure that the, the insulin bottle is fresh. Uh, so just excluding all the basic stuff. And, and that basic stuff is quite commonly an explanation why a diabetic is out of control. Once we've eliminated those factors, then I look at factors that I've done something perhaps not uh, ideal. So maybe I've picked an insulin type that is not giving us the duration of action that we want to achieve in a diabetic cat. Um, so therefore a glucose curve might tell me that, uh, in which case we need to look for a different insulin type that does give us the duration of action. Um, so those are the, the VET factors that I look at. Are we doing the management to the best of our abilities? Um, if that is all fine, then we look at PET factors. So the cat might have a disease that makes it difficult to control the diabetes. And I said acromegaly is a big one there. One in four of the diabetic cats will suffer from that. Um, pancreatitis is a big one as well. Gastrointestinal disease that results in unreliable appetite can be a, a reason why our animal is not responding well to the insulin either. And we might end up what we call a brittle diabetic. So at that stage, we need to invest in some diagnostic tests to figure out why that is happening. The important thing always is to look at the clinical picture and look at which clinical signs can I explain through the diabetes mellitus and which are the clinical signs that stand out because they don't typically come with diabetes mellitus. So vomiting, inappetence, uh, those are signs that are not compatible with normal diabetes mellitus, uh, apart from diabetic ketoacidosis, of course. Um, but we need to therefore find an explanation for those clinical signs diagnose that disease and try to treat it because that will result in a diabetic that is easier to manage.